Hello, and welcome to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I'm Brandon Testers. I'm a licensed therapist, but this is not therapy for very, very, very many reasons. Uh, I don't know. This is my tagline, I guess. Good to be here with you all. Uh, this hour is just an open conversation. It can be questions and answers. It can be responses. We, I'm aware of you guys. You're aware of me. Even if you're not in the chat, I'm aware of you, except, you know, in a general sense that I'm making guesses that there are people who are here and what kinds of things they might want to hear, or how I might be interpreted or whatever. If you are in the chat, I greatly appreciate it. And it means that you can give me specific information instead of me having to make those guesses about why you're here and what you're interested in knowing or talking about. The things that I say and do, if you're paying attention to me, it impacts you and whatever you say and do, if I'm paying attention to you, which I am paying attention to the chat, will impact me. So it'll be fun to see where this goes today. Um, I run a practice, a, a therapy and executive functioning coaching practice called Effective Artistry. That's our logo up there in the corner. Um, we do individual therapy, couples therapy, family therapy. We do executive functioning coaching. Therapy we do with people in Illinois only. Therapy licensure is state by state and we're in the state of Illinois. Uh, coaching, we have coaches that work with people from all over the world. I think I've worked with someone We've worked with people from every continent. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, I don't even know. I'm frazzled. I, I don't know what I've said or what I need to say. Uh, every week we pick a topic to start going on. If you're here in the chat and you have questions or responses or whatever that take us onto a different topic, great. We don't have to stay you know, constrained within one particular thing. We just pick something to start talking about so that there's something to start talking about until there are questions so that it's not just silence until someone says something which is by the way a thing that is quite often used in therapy is certainly taught to therapists but also in schools and all kinds of places the we're keeping it silent as a way to increase pressure make people uncomfortable so that they feel the need to say something and i hate doing that i i don't Generally, I don't like the idea of trying to get somebody to do something by making them uncomfortable. How do I know that what I want them to do is actually beneficial for them? But also, I'd rather just use the time to talk, you know? So, no, I'm not going to sit here and just stare intently at the, at the camera until somebody asks a question or something. We're going to talk. I think that's basically it. Like I was, oh, you know what? This is worth saying. Um, right now, we are almost halfway through uh, training our new cohort of executive functioning coaches. It's 12 weeks long of training, and we are in the week, middle of week five right now, uh, which means we're about to get to the part where coaches start, where the coaches who are training start working with clients. And so we have a few slots open for free work with coaches because it's training it's one of the things it's one of the ways that we're able to provide services for people who don't have the resources to be able to pay our fees uh, it would be six sessions the first four of which i personally will be there live supervising and it's called bug in the ear training either the coach will have uh, a headphone in so that i can talk to them during the session or it might be that I'm texting, you know, writing to them in the Zoom chat or whatever during the session. But for four sessions, uh, I'll be there live and then two sessions where it's recorded and I go over it with the coach afterwards. And then, of course, after that, if you want to continue working with the coach, we can talk about what arrangements are possible there. But just wanted to put that out there. We've filled up a few. I think we've already matched. Three, so we might have two spots, three slots left. So if you're interested in some coaching, this is a good time. Uh, a comment right away. Good. Because I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Identity is such a critical piece of a, of a successful life. In, I'm just starting to grasp the critical element that it is. Imagine that only 65 years. Ha ha. This is my dad. Hi, dad. What do you mean when you say identity? I'm curious. I love that word, identity. But it is used to mean a lot of different things. My 
before I started this practice, I worked at a place called the Center, the Center for Identity Potential. Uh, my mentor, his name was Andy Mahoney. His, his work generally revolves around identity, what identity is and how to utilize it in, in beneficial ways. Um, it is something that's discussed a lot. It's, being, it's a word that's thrown around these days a lot in a political context, talking about identity politics. In that case, usually mostly we're talking about labels and categories and things like that. I'm leaving some space for you to respond to my question of what you mean by identity, but you don't have to. I'll tell you, what, what I find generally most useful is the way that I learned to think of it from Andy, who the confusion of what I am rationally confiding about what I am professionally, I've learned mostly, leaned mostly on family to identify. Yeah. Well, as you can imagine, I am mixed race. My father, who is talking in the chat there, is also mixed race. Um, it is a whole interesting topic to talk about, just race and ethnicity generally, but specifically about you know being mixed race. Um, I'll say I'll, I'll say briefly what I just finished what I was going to say there about the way that Andy approaches identity, which I really think is useful, but then talk more about this because that's where we're going, I guess. Uh, the way that he taught me to think of identity is as a tool, which I, I really think is great. Of course, as with all these things, it's not that that's what identity is. It's the word, the concept identity relates to many different things, right? But identity, he would say, is a tool that you use to interact with your environment. Basically, think of it like a different lens, a different um, persona, maybe, right? That the way that I am talking right now on this stream, both the words that I'm using and the sound of my voice and the speech patterns and the pacing, the way my nonverbal communication is all different than it would be if I was sitting around playing a game with my friends. And that's different than it would be if I was talking to my mom. And that's different than it would be if I, right, that we, I, I generally, I don't like how people will talk about feeling as though they're being fake. I, to misquote the Beatles, you know, there's nothing you can do that you can't do. There's nothing you can say that you can't say. So what we mean is there are times where I'm putting more thought, more effort into being careful about how I'm presenting myself or acting or saying something differently than I would have by default if I hadn't thought about it and put more effort into it, right? And that's important to be able to distinguish because it takes that effort. It is draining to be enacting or interacting with somebody through an identity that isn't natural or comfortable for you to override your default responses, right? To think how someone might interpret what I'm about to say and all that kind of stuff. It's draining. That doesn't mean that it's fake. It's still you. It's still things that you can say. Now, of course, you might be lying or being deceitful sometimes. That's a separate issue. Sometimes I'm professional. Sometimes I am not, right? Sometimes I'm quiet, sometimes I'm verbose. It depends on the context. In fact, if you don't change how you interact with people and the environment based on the context, that's a problem. If you talk to everybody the same way, if you interact, it means you're barely paying attention to the fact that there's an environment around you. You should interact with different people differently. That's appropriate. You should interact with different spaces differently, right? So identity then is just about a way of exploring that certain ways of interacting, we do a lot. So if I meet somebody once and I interact with them real quickly, I'm not gonna have an identity entirely designed around interacting with that person. But I do have many identities through which I interact with my wife, depending on the context, right? Uh, I think that's useful because we're talking then about as, as Andy, I want to make sure to credit him for his work. It's great stuff about forming, creating identities, you know, living in and associating with other people through those identities. Uh, look him up. He's got really great stuff there. 
but just generally, I find it useful to think of it that way, that I have many different ways of being, and I use different ones at different times. The ones I use more and more and more become easier and easier and more default for me. The ones that I use less frequently are more effortful to do. So now let's get on to identity the way that you're talking about it, Dad. Which is more in that identity politics kind of a way, which means I'm looking at, you know, we're focused here on the word, the label, but the label is just a word that we're slapping onto some way of categorizing people. You're, you're dividing people up into buckets and trying to determine which of those buckets you belong in, trying to determine in which of those buckets you belong. I don't say mixed race as much as I say I'm black in white, Dutch and Scottish, I'm Polynesian. <laughs> I've accepted a generally negative label for what I am professionally. I'm an entertaining promoter. I am in my most powerful role when I'm the spokesperson. I think that's what that's meant to say. Hence, I don't sell myself well, <laughs> but I sell the crap out of others. It suggests that I can't do something because of my core identity is akin to saying I'm lazy. Yeah, well, lazy is an identity in, in this way of talking about it, right? It's a way of categorizing. If you say I'm a lazy person, you're categorizing yourself in a particular way. Um, I'm, I'm distracted by particular wording there because I also don't sell myself well, I guess I would say but other people would probably disagree with that. I don't promote. I like to be helpful and valuable and useful, and I like to be visible and authentic, and I hope that it is helpful, and I hope that other people then hear about it and find out about it so that it can be helpful to them as well. I really, in fact, I was engaged in a conversation earlier today about marketing and sales and stuff, just kind of generally. I don't... And it's easy to say this given my circumstances and the line of work that we're in and all that. I don't generally like the idea of trying to convince somebody that what you are offering is what they need. I like giving as much information as possible about what it is that you're offering so that people can make a determination of whether they think that it might be what they need or not. I don't want to convince somebody to do something. I just want to let them know what options they have that they could do because I don't want to work with somebody that's not looking for the kind of work that I'm doing. It's miserable to sit there and try and work with somebody and not be helpful in the way that they're wanting you to be. I don't want to be in that situation. I don't want them to waste their time, their money, their energy. I don't want to be in that position. I, and of course we have to make our guesses, right? You can't know, but I give, that's why we do free consults. It's part of the reason that we do this stream. I often will tell people to come to the stream when they're talking about trying to make a determination of whether they might want to work with somebody here or not. I'm just trying to give information. And if you like what you see, cool. And if you don't, cool. I'm glad. I would much rather you and I both know that now than later on down the line. Kind of like, I, I actually, this goes back to identity too. I use this metaphor, I suppose, a lot with people where imagine you're on a first date and imagine that you're really great at reading what it is the other person is looking for, wanting from you, this person that they're on a date with, you know, and imagine that you can give it to them. Even if it's not your natural way of being, your easiest default way of being, you can do it, right? So it's not fake because you have to have information to be able to say something that contains information and et cetera. But let's say you do that. You give them what they want. If it's not what you do by default, if it's not the easiest, lowest energy version of you, if it's something that you're putting on, you know, putting a lot of effort into, well, what are you hoping to get by giving that person what they're looking for? You're hoping to get, I suppose, a second date. And then you probably will because you're giving them what they're looking for. And then you'll get a third and a fourth. And somewhere down the line, theoretically, there will come a day when you are too tired or distracted or there's other things going on or you just don't want to do it anymore and you slip back into being the default version of yourself. And at that point, they'll see it and they'll either like it, in which case they probably would have liked it if you had shown them that at the beginning, you could have saved yourself a lot of hassle or they won't. And now you're in a six month long relationship finding out that you're not a good fit as opposed to finding out you're not a good fit on the first date. The point of going on a date isn't to impress the other person it's to determine mutually whether or not 
the two of you each want to go on a second date. If we're focused on giving the other person the information they want, then we'll get the second date, but we won't be assessing for whether we want to be involved in it, whether they're giving us what we want. We're entering with the premise that it's about impressing the other person, not that they need to impress us or that we need to find some value, some fit there, right? So I think that that is true of all like marketing and sales and stuff generally, but especially in the therapy world and in the coaching world, like we're going to be sitting down and talking for 50 minutes a week for who knows how long. I do not want to give you an inaccurate impression of what that's going to be like, because then what? We just get to go through a miserable process where we end up not working together anyway. I think this is true, not just to therapy, but generally it's a very short game, right? It's aimed at maximizing the money that you make off of people in a quick burst because they won't stick around if you've convinced them that what you're offering them isn't actually what you're offering them. The negative connotation of being a promoter. Being a promoter is not inherently, I think you're making some typos. Can come from a place of authenticity but especially when attempting to sell self it seems self-serving but is it when you or i say we're good at speaking it's not brag it's just a fact as long as it's relevant to the needs of the other parties of the conversation not inherently disingenuous or self-serving yeah no it is not inherently disingenuous and again this is kind of what we're talking about generally what do you what do we mean when we say promoter or promote or sell or sales there is a negative connotation that i get like I've been talking about, where it's about trying to convince somebody that what they're looking for is what you're offering, or I guess supposedly the other way, that what you're offering is what they're looking for. That's why I like to focus on being visible. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I'm just giving as much access as I can to as much information as I am able to so that people can look and decide whether or not that's something that they're interested in. It's authentic. And yes, I think that I've definitely we could say that this, me doing this stream, we could say is promotion. So I don't think promotion is inherently negative. I am talking about that connotation of trying to convince somebody of something instead of just offering something to somebody. You know, I've had consults, for example, where I'll say, uh, here's our rate, right? Which is not a secret. I'm happy to say what it is. We charge $85 per session for executive functioning coaching, $150 for therapy sessions. When I work with people directly, I charge $200 per session. Uh, we take Blue Cross Blue Shield. Otherwise, for therapy, we do what's called super billing, which means clients pay their invoice and then submit to their insurance to be reimbursed at the out-of-network rate, whatever that plan is, however that's covered. And we have as many options as we can for reduced fee rates and and um, even no fee services, like I was talking about at the beginning of this, we have a few slots right now for six weeks of six sessions of coaching work for no money. We're not trying to milk people for all we can. We're trying to be sustainable and a business model that works, right? That the people who work here also have bills to pay. <laughs> um, anyway, there have been times in consoles where I'll say that I'll say, here are our rates. And I'll get a response like, oh, you think I have more, you know, disposable income than I do. And no, I don't. I don't think anything of what your disposable income is or isn't. I'm just informing you of what our rates are. If it's not a fit, it's not a fit. And when it's not, if people say that, you know, I can't afford that, but I am interested in the work, then I say, well, great. We have some options for reduced fee services. And here's what that process looks like. Actually, this is kind of like related to something I've been thinking about, talking about a lot recently in terms of communication, where, so I use the word efficient a lot, right? Oh, by the way, on the promoter thing, the thing that is inherent in promotion doesn't have to be self-serving or disingenuous by any means, it can be authentic, but there is an inherent statement in that in promotion, in what I'm doing right now, of I think that it might be helpful or useful or interesting to other people. What I am doing, I think, might have value to other people. So sometimes we ourselves are very uncomfortable with that. I am still very uncomfortable with the idea that 
I'm effectively going about my life as though I have value to other people in what I say and how I say it. It seems to be true based on the reactions that people get give me, you know, but it's an uncomfortable feeling to deal with. And certainly other people could look at what I'm doing and say that about me because it's true. Oh, he thinks that what he's doing is valuable to people. I do. That doesn't mean I think it's valuable to everybody. It doesn't mean I think it's more valuable than comparable things other people are doing. It just means that I think it might be of interest. It might be relevant. It might be helpful. It might be of value to some people. So I'm going to put it out there. I want those people to be able to have access to it as easily as possible. And I want to be visible so that people can make a determination about whether that's true for them, whether they're a person who finds value in, in, in what this is or not. If I hide all that, no, no, I won't tell you what I'm doing until you, you know, come pay us session fees and whatever, then how's anybody going to know? But yeah, it, there is a, a presumption of, I think there's something valuable here and I, we can have a negative reaction to that, even though that's an accurate thing. I can have a negative reaction to it in myself, or I can have a negative reaction to it in somebody else. Anyway, communication, what I was starting to go on. I've been talking with people a lot about efficient communication. And efficient, I like the word efficient, because it implies cheap, but that works, right? We want it to, to utilize as few of our resources as possible while using as many resources as necessary to do what it's trying to do. That's why I don't say cheap communication or low cost communication, efficient. Because if I try to communicate something in very few words, for example, if I'm focusing on the time and energy that it takes for me to say things and for you to interpret them, if I try to use very few words to communicate something, if I get whatever I'm trying to communicate across well enough that we accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, great. But if I don't, and you then have to ask for clarification, well, now we might be spending more resources than we would have if I had just said more stuff in the first place. Or maybe you don't know to ask for clarification because you think you understand what I'm saying and I think you understand what I'm saying. And we both think we've got it and then we go on and realize later, oh, we were thinking different things. We were interpreting different things. So that's not efficient then either. The brain, I've said this a million times, cognitive miser. The brain does not spend resources without a reason to do so. That means anything you're doing, you are attempting to do the bare minimum necessary in order to accomplish that thing, including even in the information, the data, the level of detail you get about those, whatever you're interacting with, right? That I might only hear a few of your words. I might only see just a vague outline of where the furniture is in the room in order for me to walk through that room. And usually that works. And every once in a while I trip and fall because there was something on the ground and some, you know, something that wasn't quite level that I didn't miss because I didn't think it was necessary. Sometimes we have miscommunications that cause problems because I didn't think it was necessary to say something in more words and more detail than I did. So we're always trying to do the minimum. Efficient communication, it's relative. It's about what is the bare minimum you need to do in order to get what you're trying to get done? But I do, I found use lately in separating out different pieces of communication, identifying like the role, the function of different parts of communication. So one is just sharing relevant information, right? And, and that's probably if, if I'm having a discussion with somebody, if there's any form of communication going on intentionally, right, then, then that's the bare minimum possible. If I'm not doing something to give you information that I think you don't have and think you would find useful, then I'm not really communicating anything of value to you in the first place, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean like what we're doing here where I'm presenting ideas and frameworks and sharing research and whatever. It can be when somebody gets home and walks in the door and says, hey, I'm home, right? It's here's information that I think you don't have and I think you would find useful or interesting or relevant is that I'm home. Or if we're, hey, what do you wanna get for dinner tonight? I'm conveying to you, I have not decided what to get for dinner tonight. So I don't know. If that, that's information I'm not sure that you have. I'm trying to solicit information from you, et cetera. 
Then on top of that, we can do a lot of stuff that is about making guesses about how that information will be interpreted or how that communication will be interpreted, I should say. So I don't know, what's an example? If I were trying to say, hey, I'll be home at 3.30, because that's an actual thing that I said today, <laughs> you know, that would be my default. That's the easiest way to express that information. I'll be home at 3.30. If I am then going to say in my head, well, what if, what if they don't like that? What if they wish that I was home earlier than that? Well, then I might be able to say, hey, um, I know it's a bummer, but I'm not going to be able to be home until 3.30. So now it's not just the information about when I'll be home. It's also the information about why that's the time. Because I am guessing, I'm predicting that you might have an objection to me coming home at 3.30. And I'm trying to preempt that, that possible question, possible conflict by giving you the information up front. I'm giving you my reasoning, my justification before you've asked for it, because I think you might ask for it later. Does that make sense to anybody? I'm actually, I'm, I'm working on trying to be able to communicate this concept well, <laughs> concisely, efficiently, I suppose that there's the default way of sharing the information, then there's making guesses about how the other person will interpret your communication and respond to your communication. And how, if you don't like, if you're aware of multiple potential interpretations, some of which you like more than others, or multiple potential responses, some of which you like more than others, then you can go back and modify the original communication before you say anything at all to try and make it more likely that you get the interpretation and the response that you want or avoid the, the responses that you don't want. This is a, I don't know why, but for some reason, discussing this is feels harder to me than discussing other things solo. Like this seems easier to discuss when there's somebody else on the other end of the conversation. Maybe it's because I'm having a hard time coming up with examples. Um, but that second category of communication that the making predictions about how someone will interpret you, how they will respond and therefore editing what I'm going to say in advance so that I try to make it so that I get the response I'm looking for or more likely or less likely that I avoid the one I'm trying to avoid. The more that we're doing of that, the less safe we're feeling, particularly when it comes to communication, we're feeling less safe about having an opportunity to clarify if there is some interpretation that's different than what we intended right if if i say let's see i need i need a good okay if i say to somebody if if we're hanging out and i say hey this has been fun we should do this again sometime right if i feel very safe and comfortable with that person I don't need to think that long or that hard about what I'm about to say, because it's just a true statement I'm sharing with them. Let's assume in this scenario that it is a true statement that I it did actually have fun, do actually want to hang out with them again sometime. Right. Hey, this was fun. We should do this again sometime. Now, I'm aware that sometimes people say that phrase when what they really mean is I want this interaction to end. And I feel too socially awkward to say anything that might be perceived as negative or critical. So I'm going to, to end this interaction in a way that makes it sound like I've enjoyed it without actually committing me to having to interact with you again in the future because I don't want to. Hey, this was great. We should do this again sometime. So if I'm the person on the other end of that communication, if I'm receiving that, I can interpret it differently depending on the context, right? I could validly say, well, they said sometime, not a specific time. They didn't make any specific plans. They didn't ask me about when I'm free or try to start a conversation making those plans. So that implies to me that they don't actually want to hang out. They're just kind of saying that they want to hang out, which means if that's the case, that they probably didn't really enjoy this. And that might be a lie. And why would they lie? Well, because they think I'm too difficult to communicate with or that I'm going to get angry at them if they tell me the truth or that they'll hurt me and I'm fragile or blah, 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 blah. But if I'm interpreting it as genuine, then I might say, yeah, well, they're leaving it open because 
that's the easiest for me then to respond. They're not putting me on the spot and saying, hey, when would you like to hang out next? They're just declaring that they would like to do this again and letting me respond the way that I want to. Same thing, the lack of specificity and detail can be interpreted different ways, right? So if I'm going to say that, I need to be aware of the context. I need to make my guess about how they might interpret it. If I think that they're likely to interpret it as, oh, they're just lying because they want to get out of here, then I'm going to probably try and change it, right? I'm going to not say it that way. I'm going to say, hey, genuinely, this was really great. I would like to do this some other time. I'd like to hang out more with you. What's a good time that works for you or whatever, right? The more effort I put into that, into predicting their response, maybe let me phrase it as the amount of effort I put into that is directly correlated with the insecurity I feel in the relationship. Because if I said that to my best friend of 20 years and they, for some reason, somehow interpreted it to mean I'm doing the fake version, right? That I want out of here and I don't think I can actually tell you that. So I'm trying to be fakey nice. If my friend interpreted it that way, we have a long relationship. We have a history with each other. We've communicated a lot. And I feel pretty confident that my friend then would say back to me, hey, hold up. Are you trying to give me, you know, like brush me off or whatever? They would give me the opportunity. They would tell me what their interpretation is and give me the opportunity to clarify in case that wasn't the case. Oh, no, sorry. Okay, I get it now. Yes, it could sound like that. No, no, that's not what I meant. I genuinely am having fun and would like to hang out again. I wanted to, you know, I just didn't want to like make, have that conversation right now. I got to get going, but let's text soon or whatever. If it's somebody I don't know well, I don't think that they're as invested in our relationship and therefore it's not as worth it to them to consider that they might have interpreted me differently than I intended. In other words, we're more nervous about first impressions for a reason. Think of it like if you're reading a book, right? If you go to read a book, assuming that you're, you know, that you feel free to stop reading a book at any time because some people you know, once you start reading a book, it, you got to finish it, even if it's terrible. Well, let's assume that you can quit reading a book if you decide that it isn't, you know, enjoyable. That first line has to carry a lot of weight because that first line of the book has to convince you that it's worth reading the second line. So if that first line is good, yeah, I'll keep reading. If the first line is terrible, I might keep reading, I, you know, but I might not. I might be like, okay, never mind. Yeah, don't like that. Hell, even... There's a reason that the title, the, the cover, the picture, the coloring, the font, all that stuff, the earlier it is in our interactions, the less information I have, then the few things that I'm saying have to give me reason to look further, right? So the first line makes it, it has to give me reason to read the second line. And the second line has to, if the first line is terrible, I'm going to stop. But by the time I've read 50 pages, now if I read a line that's terrible, well, I'm probably going to keep going because I wouldn't have read 50 pages if I wasn't mostly enjoying what I was reading. So now each line isn't as necessary in terms of, you know, convincing me to keep going. Now I've got a relationship with the book. I've, I've read many lines, many paragraphs, many pages worth of reading that told me that it's worth going. So now if I see one that tells me that it's not worth going on, I will probably just say, okay, bad line, keep going. I, I hope this makes sense. Somebody give me some feedback. I don't know. I, there, I think there are a few of you in chat right now, but I'm not sure. So first impressions, early interactions matter. Back to that first date and identity and all that stuff, right? That we're more focused on what other people want from us at the beginning because we're trying to give them reason to actually pay attention and listen to us. We want to be able to relax. We don't like having to feel like we're on display and having to be like, okay, what are the important manners? There's a reason that it can be so, um, it can bring such relief to just say, this is an awkward situation or I feel weird right now. <clears throat> because part of the implicit like reason that that might be happening is that I, ha I don't know if that other person is comfortable with acknowledging the context or not. 
I don't know if it's if I'm supposed to be playing the game like, oh, we both like doing this, you know, pretending like this is enjoyable, in part because if I say this is unenjoyable, I'm worried they might interpret that as I find you to be unpleasant, which might not be what I mean. I might mean you're interesting. I on this date for a reason. I want to get to know you. And a first date, the situation of it is awkward and unenjoyable. And if that person responds, yeah, you're right. It is kind of weird, but you know, relax. We're just talking. <coughs> Excuse me. Then that might be great. If they respond to say like, uh, I don't feel weird. Why do you feel weird? What's weird? Then I might be like, oh, never, never mind. Yeah, I was just joking, right? I don't know why I have to drink so much water today. My throat is dry. So we want to be able to relax. Just generally, discomfort, which is, you know, just an earlier version of pain. You know, the difference between discomfort and pain is a matter of degree, right? Discomfort means there is something I am having to spend resources on. It is inherently uncomfortable to have to spend resources because we don't want to notice things, cognitive miser. I want to be able to do and think and notice other stuff. Anything that makes me have to pay attention, like, oh, your throat is dry. That's annoying to me. It's uncomfortable. That's what pain and discomfort is. It is a signal of this must be addressed. And that's annoying. We don't want that. So we want to resolve it. So if we feel awkward or tense, we want to get comfortable as fast as possible. And a lot of that is just about communicating safety to people. If you can get to a point, and a, part, a large part of what we do in therapy and in coaching too, you know, in terms of setting up the relationship, but it's more of a focus in therapy, is just getting really efficient at communicating that sense of safety to somebody else. Like, how many days do you have to go on with somebody before you end up at a place where you're like, okay, I can relax, I don't have to worry and primp and, you know, try and make sure that I'm very carefully controlling their impression of me. We don't want people to have to experience that ever, but especially in therapy, it's counterproductive, right? It means that we're not getting authentic responses and everything is meaningful and useful, even when it's things like, oh, this person doesn't feel safe with me, right? It doesn't mean that that person's doing it wrong, but it means that our focus is on changing that as quickly as possible. And so part of that we talk about in therapy is unconditional positive regard, which, man, I really think would just be beneficial for people. I should say different people interpret that concept differently. So I was going to say, I think that would be beneficial for us all to use with people. But there are definitions of that that we definitely should not all be using with all people all the time. The version I'm talking about, the way of thinking of it that I'm talking about is assume good faith, assume good intent. Now, that's not safe to do, right? If somebody is being a jerk to you or threatening you, it is much safer to assume that, yes, they are threatening me, they will cause me harm, and I need to react as though that's the case, than it is to say, well, I interpreted that as a threat, but maybe they didn't mean to threaten me. That keeps me around interacting with this person, so it's less safe. Whether or not they intended it as a, as a threat doesn't change my feeling of safety. Now, if somebody I know and trust have a lot of interactions with threatens me, then I'm going to say, hmm, that seems out of character. They, I don't think they would threaten me. I better check. Were you threatening me? there like let me just clarify right so again that that safety we are looking for reasons to i don't know i like how i was phrasing that but let me finish how i was phrasing it to me that's one of those authenticity things is if halfway through i'm like ah maybe this gives the wrong interpretation well, that's just my guess. So let me finish saying it instead of being like, no, no, you can't hear it that way. Because I trust you then to know that I'll clarify if it was different than what I, if your interpretation is different than what I intended, right? And now I completely forgot what I was going to say. Oh, I was going to say, we're looking for reasons to cut people out. 
to say, I should not be around that person. I should not spend resources on that person. And I don't like that phrasing because we're looking for reasons to interact with people, you know, like either way, it's the same thing. I didn't want it to sound like we're looking to be judgmental, but it's that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like before I'm concerned about whether you and I like the same type of music, before that, I want to make sure that you're not going to murder me, right? Like once I feel safe that you're not going to physically harm me, then I can talk to you a little bit. And once we're talking and, and I feel comfortable that you're not going to, you know, socially harm me, then I can get into more. We work up the chain that way. And you can't do that with everybody. We don't have the resources. We don't have the time and the energy to have deep conversations with every person all the time. So we have relationships. In fact, there's a um, concept called Dunbar's number, which just I'm bringing it up because roughly it refers to the idea that theoretically, for most of the evolutionary history of humanity, we lived in social contexts of limited size. We were evolved, our brains and our bodies evolved to be optimal in the conditions that we evolved in. And so people will use different evidence and different research to make their guesses about what's that number of people. 150, by the way, is Dunbar's number. That's the specific number that that person, I don't know what Dunbar's first name is or gender or anything, but 150 is the number that Dunbar arrived at. Uh, but different people make different suggestions. Either way, the point is the same that for me to be very deeply aware of a person takes a lot of resources. So the depth of awareness of knowledge and experience that I have of one person detracts from the resources I would have available to be that aware of any other person. So there's a balancing point, right? If I am aware of a million people equally, I'm going to be very, very like shallow awareness of those people. If I'm only aware of one person, I'm going to know a lot about that one person. And what that ends up working out in our lives is, again, people disagree on the numbers, but theoretically, roughly, we have, I don't know, some numbers that are suggested are somewhere between three to 10 close relationships, and then another 20 to 40, like, you know, second tier relationships where we have relationships, we have experience, we have connection, but it's not, you know, the kinds of people that we're thinking about and interacting with on a daily basis or, you know, almost a daily basis. And then beyond that, we kind of got to group people up, which brings us back to identity. I am roughly aware, well, let me say it this way. I am aware of the fact that there's 8 billion-ish people living on this planet. Am I aware of each of those people as individuals? Of course not. It's not possible to be. But again, evolutionary context, knowing roughly about how many people existed in the entirety of the earth was not something that we ever had an opportunity. We, I'm saying our evolutionary ancestors had an opportunity or a reason to do. It wasn't something we spent resources on. You were only, they would have only been aware of people with whom they interacted directly which means that broadly our brains and bodies would have been optimized to be X a level of aware of Y number of people, right? And now we're aware of way more of those people, but I can't be aware of them all as individuals. So I have to be aware of them as groups then instead. And this is where stereotypes come in. Stereotype, by the way, different from prejudice, prejudice involves, uh, value assignment that I think something is good or bad. A stereotype is just, I think this is true of this category of person, kind of person. And they're never true of every individual, or at least rarely true of every individual that fits that description. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing that you're that you're judging it to be a bad thing that is true or a good thing that is true of them. It can just be something that you think is accurate and dictates how you interact with and think of those people. I'm raging all over the place. I haven't had a comment in 30 minutes or so. So the longer it goes, <laughs> someone not saying something in the chat, the farther out I get. Just generally, people ignore cost. We think what well, would be better to be more aware of the individual characteristics of every person. Yes, would be. 
not something we can actually afford to do. And every moment we spend doing that is a cost. We can't spend that moment doing something else. So if you're aware of a lot of people, you're aware of them shallowly. But what really happens is kind of a tier system, you know, right? Like not a tier, it's just individual. They're each person I'm aware of them to a different extent. I, I think a lot, a lot about my wife. I think a lot about my kids. I know a lot about them. I, I incorporate my thoughts about how they would respond to something into almost everything that I do. I don't think to that level of depth, depth about anybody else. On the far other side of the spectrum are people that I know nothing about except for the fact that they exist. In the 8 billion-ish people on this planet, I know that many people exist, roughly, or at least I believe that that many people exist, but that's about all I know about them, right? So I can break it down into smaller groups. Well, so many of these people, X number of these people live in China and therefore are Chinese, and X number of these people live in Africa and are African or in Nigeria and are therefore Nigerian, oh, except for the expats, blah, blah, blah. We make assumptions not about people specifically, but about people, yes. We make assumptions about anything and everything because we can't pay attention to anything and everything. So we, until an assumption causes us a problem, we can't go back and revise it. And I want to clarify that more because I feel like this is going to sound like... Right now... I can pretty confidently guess that you have not looked above you to figure out what would be a good landing spot just in case gravity reversed all of a sudden and you fell away from the ground instead of toward it. What a ridiculous concept to even throw it out there. Yes, of course you have not done that. I haven't done that because it's never happened. So making an assumption, the language we use for that sounds like an active process. Making, I'm doing a thing. I am consciously and intentionally or actively making an assumption. It's not. It's a lot of these things are ways of describing things that happen, meaning making an assumption means after the fact, we realize that there was something that we did not pay attention to, meaning we made an assumption that we didn't pay attention to, didn't need to pay attention to it until that thing causes a problem. And we can look and say, oh, it would have been better if I had paid attention to this thing or this element of this thing. Then we can say, oh, I made an assumption and it was bad. So it's not causing me problems that I don't know the names of all, I don't know, what, what's the population of some random city? How many people live in Paris? I don't know the names of all those people. It's not been a problem. If I met somebody from Paris, well, then not knowing, you know, and they introduced themselves and then not remembering their name, not knowing their name would be a problem. So I spend resources on remembering the name. Just means that the less you interact with someone, the less aware you are of those of that person, the more you're using assumptions and models of people generally who fit those categories. A lot of this is identity politics stuff, right? That we're thinking about what do pick whatever label what do this category of people want to hear as though all of those people, and of course they don't, but we're using it as a shorthand, right? It's not to say that it is good to group people up in this way. It's I'm saying it is necessary. You cannot be aware of every given individual. So that, so being mixed race, What do I want to say about this? <laughs> I was about to get very like vulnerable and well, maybe I will. I don't know. Back to the promotion thing. Yeah, I put myself out there. I'm comfortable. As my dad said, we're both good speakers. I, I'm good at giving a presentation. I'm good at answering questions. Even as compared to other people who do the kind of work that I do, I tend to be more comfortable or at least appear to be more comfortable in doing things like this, having a conversation that I didn't prepare for and don't have a slideshow and, you know, everybody shush while I tell you about, no, because I'm happy and ready and comfortable to just be visible, go wherever for you to see my flaws and vulnerabilities and whatever. Now I have a whole philosophy around that, but that's a retroactive philosophy because 
before this, I was an actor. I was comfortable with that. But why was I comfortable being an actor or want to be? People pay attention to me more so than it seems like the average person. And there are probably reasons for that. The fact that I'm 6'5 probably has something to do with it. But I think that there is an element of it that it is hard to categorize. In other words, if you become aware of somebody, but you don't know what identity labels to apply to that person and therefore don't have a lot of rules and information about how to interact with that person because you don't know what categories they you know, fall under, then you're in a position where you're forced to pay more attention to that person if you have to interact with them. If you are a person who is used to having, not used to, every time you have an experience where you become aware of the fact that other people were paying attention to you when you did not intentionally try to get them to pay attention to you that's kind of terrifying oh people are noticing me even when i don't think they're noticing me or want them to be noticing me or i'm, I'm not trying to get them to notice me and there are different ways to respond to that for me a lot of that has been my response to that is, okay, well then if that's what's gonna be happening, then I'm just gonna be comfortable with the idea that anything I'm doing at any time, people might be noticing so that I can stop thinking about it. I think being mixed race plays into this a lot. There's a, um, Derald Wing Sue is a, uh, I actually don't know. I think he's a therapist or psychologist, but he writes about this kind of thing and um, in his in his book on counseling, you know, multicultural counseling, counseling people from various different cultures, there's chapters on all the different cultures, which is kind of the point I'm making. It's, of course, saying this, these things don't apply to all people, blah, blah, blah. But if you're working with someone who is from this category, then be aware that people from this category may think this way or may respond in this way kind of stuff. He has one chapter in that book on mixed race people. There's not a lot of information out there about us because we're a relatively recent phenomenon, at least in any kind of numbers that make it worthwhile for people to pay attention to as a group. And in that chapter, he talks about the question, the question that mixed race people always get, which is, what are you? In my particular case, I like to say that I am mostly white passing. Oh, thank you. Not my home. This is my office, but thank you. Uh, and yes, designed to look good on a, on a Zoom. People think it's a like fake background, virtual background, but you know, it's my actual office. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's what the brain does. It's not a. It's not that people. What am I trying to say? When someone asks me, what are you? So I'm, I, I think of myself as mostly white passing, which means that when people pass me on the street and don't pay much attention to me, it's just out of the corner of their eye, I look close enough to being white. Oh, Indian, okay. Uh, close enough to being white that they don't note any other difference because in the areas where I have lived most of my life, white is the most common and therefore the default and people don't differentiate me from that but that I would probably get that same reaction in many different areas, even where the default was something different. Once we start talking and somebody looks more closely at me, then nobody thinks I'm white anymore, but they don't know what I am, but they don't always feel comfortable asking, what are you? Because they feel like it might be offensive and it might be. That absolutely is something that many people consider to be a microaggression. And depending on who you are in the context and how you ask me, I might consider it rude or offensive. Generally though, not so much because I think of it this way, which is your brain is trying to categorize me. You're trying to match me into categories of people so that you can have an easier time interacting with me, right? And it's struggling to do that because this feature looks kind of like this, but this feature looks kind of like this and those are mutually exclusive things. And so various lengths of time, but sooner or later, people generally get around to asking that question, what are you? And I have an answer, I have a default answer because I've been asked it so many times. And it's changed over the course of my life. For a long time, my default answer was, well, well I'm a lot of different things. I'm about one eighth Chinese and one eighth Indonesian. I've got some African ancestry and I'm about half white, a little bit less than half white, uh, which is various European, blah, blah, blah. 
a while back I stopped giving that answer and instead started saying I'm mixed race. It's it's a big just hodgepodge, you know, because I don't really think it's useful to people to know that I'm specifically one eighth Chinese. What information might that give them about me? I'm not. There's not an eighth of me that you can interact with in some kind of a way. I am just me. I'm a mixture. I am the mixture of all that stuff. And I can still, I will answer those questions about the specifics if people want to know, but, you know, only really if they're feeling like they really need to know. Because <laughs> otherwise, the point of getting that information is to then stop paying close attention to somebody. Oh, oh, okay. Which is why the next response that you get from that, people say, what are you? you give them the answer almost always the response after that will be some version of them validating or invalidating that identity by saying what they see or revealing their oh i see that i see that yeah i can tell especially around the eyes or really i don't see that huh or i see this part but not that part or oh see i was guessing this or whatever and Of course, some element of my identity is wrapped up in or impacted by how I look, but a lot of it isn't. And so I could take offense at that and say, oh, you're trying to say what you think I look like, you know, give your opinion on whether I'm allowed to claim being mixed race or not, because you think that's a big enough percentage of my ancestry or not in order to be able to use a lot of the identity politics arguing stuff comes from that. It's who counts. We're not making extra buckets for people. There's only these many buckets. And so we got to figure out which one to put you in. But the truth is legally, even back in the early days of America, in different states, I would be treated differently. In some states that had the one drop rule, I would be considered black. In other states, I would not because they had different laws on the books of how much percentage of your ancestry has to be black in order for you to be black. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit off topic. Point is, that's what the brain is looking to do at all times is find answers find categories find labels so that we can stop paying attention because that's discomfort having to spend resources on something is uncomfortable wondering what race i am and then having to think about is it acceptable for me to ask or not ask is that okay or not that's all uncomfortable so we are looking to be able to put people and things and concepts, everything as quickly as possible into buckets that we already know. So I can say, oh, you're just this. There's a particular term, the anchor and modify heuristic, which means that not only are we looking to do that, if we encounter something that doesn't fit perfectly into one of those buckets that we already have, then we'll modify it, but only to the minimal amount necessary, meaning, oh, so basically you're Asian, but you know, with some white or whatever, or basically you're white, but with some Asian, I've gotten both of those responses. <laughs> I was going to say, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It's not that it's good or that it's bad. It's a thing that happens and it happens in large part because there's value in knowing more information about somebody specifically but there's a cost that you have to pay in order to get that information. And you can't do that with everybody, with everything. So yes, everybody wants easy, clear, simple answers at first. Every brain wants that because of course, not at first, always. And that works the vast, vast majority of the time. Everything we are doing in our lives mostly works. And I know that sounds terrible to people who are experiencing a lot of discomfort and pain and a lot of suffering. I'm not trying to negate or invalidate those negative experiences. I'm saying that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That most of what we're doing, most of how we interact with the world works for us because if it didn't, we would change it. When people, when things are problems ongoing, it's because those things normally work for us. If I overthink things all the time, it's because thinking is normally a very useful way for me to go about doing things, except for when I encounter those things, those times, those contexts in which it doesn't work for some reason, which is a rare exception, but that's the ones that I notice. So it feels like every time I think there's a problem when really, no, usually I solve it. So we navigate our world. We interact with one another. We get through things, do things that we need to accomplish, and we mostly do it fine. 
and then sometimes we don't. And when we don't, when it causes a problem, that's when it's time to say, okay, now I need to look more closely at this thing, understand it, get more information about it so that I can interact with it differently because the way I've been doing isn't working for me. But we have a tendency to get locked in at that point to say, okay, there's a problem and I need help fixing it. And I am not open to or willing to revisit or look in further depth or detail to anything that I have previously already figured out. And that gets in the way. How are you supposed to engage with things differently without actually thinking of them any differently? And how are you supposed to think of them any differently if you don't spend more of your resources engaging with or observing or becoming aware of those things in some way? The simplest answer that works is the best one, efficiency. Fewest resources necessary in order to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish is the best. Sometimes we guess too much on, uh, sometimes we, we guess that we can get by with fewer resources than it actually will take. So we're wrong all the time. And then that's when we have problems. Our problems, I don't wanna minimize, You know, we're not in control of everything that happens to us. But to the extent that we can control, influence, impact the things that are happening to us, which is the part that's worth focusing on the most because that's where we can make changes, those elements of things, you know, if we have a problem, we want to look for those elements of it. What am I doing or saying or thinking or feeling or experiencing or believing that's contributing to that problem? And in order to change any of that, we have to look at those things in more depth. And in order to look at things in more depth, we have to be able to consider that, actually somebody tweeted recently, and I love this way of phrasing it, uh, it wasn't like a viral tweet or anything, so I want to make sure to, I don't know who it was, but that in order to change your mind about anything, you first have to conceptualize of a world in which you can be wrong about something and it not be a crisis. People have a tendency to equate being wrong with being bad, and those are two separate things. I'm wrong all the time. That doesn't make me bad. Sometimes it means I do bad things or I harm people in some way and I don't like that and that's bad. Still, it's rooted in being wrong. There's a reason that it's important to identify intention, even though intention doesn't change harm that was caused. If I accidentally hit you, your nose is broken, whether I intended to or not. But the intentionality of it impacts other things like how you interact with me in the future or how you interact with other people like me in the future and et cetera. I got to go. And I'm wanting some like nice way to wrap this all up and I don't really have it. I guess that's the point. It's all very complicated. You know, it's not simple. There aren't easy answers. And I can give the easy answers that everybody is looking for, and I do. But only after we talk about the fact that there aren't easy answers. So these are suggestions that you try and you get information in this way about, you know, learning the process. Because otherwise, if I just say, yeah, yeah, do it this way, do it that way, it has a tendency to cause more harm than good. And I wish I could expand on that, but I can't because I got to go. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And I'll be here at the same time next week. Bye-bye.